Now it is time for the last word with Ali Velshi, who is in for Lawrence. Good evening, Ali. Not your biggest fan tonight. I, I was trying to get ready for this show, and then you did this thing about this councilman in uh, Enid, Oklahoma. And then I was like, hey, I got a show to do. But I was glued to that and that you did it and that you had that conversation with Brandy. Uh, without, you know, covering these stories, uh, I think many of us would just not know that stuff like that happens, that this it's guy really, ran on that campaign. It's really important to know that yeah. other people in deep, deeply red states, yes. largely Republican yes. states, see some of this white supremacy and the and great say no. replacement area and, and say no, not This is us. not us. Not, yep, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for doing that, my friend. It's great to Thank see you, you as always. Thank you. Have a good show. You have a great evening. The battle for the American presidency in 2024 will likely come down to another battle of the blue wall, which includes Michigan and Wisconsin, two reliably Democratic states that flipped red in 2016 and led to Donald Trump's shock victory. Aided, of course, by third party candidates, votes for Jill Stein in both states in 2016 were larger than the vote difference between Trump and Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden won back both states in 2020, winning Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and that pushed him to 270 electoral votes even before Georgia and Arizona. So it cannot be overstated how critical these battleground states are. And today, Donald Trump took his election-denying, xenophobic, apocalyptic stump speech to Michigan and Wisconsin, where there is a presidential primary tonight, by the way. Our first guest tonight will be Michigan's Democratic governor, Gretchen Whitner, Whitmer, who will join me in just a moment. Trump started his day with an anti-immigration screed in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the Democratic National Committee launched a new billboard campaign to remind everyone that he lobbied Republicans to tank the bipartisan border security bill. In 2020, Donald Trump lost Michigan to Joe Biden by 154,188 votes. Here's part of the vision of America that he pitched to voters in Michigan today. Weirdly, and a little dictatory, encircled by local sheriffs and a police union guy in uniform. It's a bloodbath. They tried to use that term incorrectly on me two weeks ago. You know, it's all about misinformation. If we don't win on November 5th, I think our country is going to cease to exist. Now, this is not the first time that Donald Trump has predicted that the United States will cease to exist if he loses. What could cease to exist in this country if Donald Trump wins is the right to an abortion, even in states where it is currently legal, even in states where the Constitution of that state guarantees it. Donald Trump has teased a 15-week federal abortion ban, and today he announced that his presidential campaign will release more details about his abortion policy. Now, this news comes after the Florida Supreme Court allowed that state's six-week abortion ban to take effect. Six weeks. But in a separate decision, the court will allow Florida voters to decide in November whether to expand reproductive rights in that state. Biden's campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, told reporters today, quote, Donald Trump is directly to blame for the fact that abortion has now been effectively banned across the entire southeastern United States, end quote. And today, NBC News broke the story that Arizona abortion rights advocates say they've gathered signatures needed to put a constitutional amendment on the 2024 ballot to protect abortion access up to viability. Meanwhile, Michigan Democrats are expanding reproductive freedoms for Michiganders. And our next guest, the Michigan Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, signed into law yesterday a series of bills known collectively as the Michigan Family Protection Act, which provides legal protections for families whose children were born via in vitro fertilization. The legislation also ended Michigan's criminal ban on paid surrogacy. Protecting reproductive freedom and choice was a promise that Governor Whitner has kept since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. As minority leader, I urge my colleagues to take the floor and express their outrage and share their stories. And one of them was about to, but he couldn't because it was too difficult. And that's when I realized, how could I ask a colleague to tell their story when I wasn't yet prepared to share my own. So I took to the podium and put aside my prepared remarks and shared the story that I'd only told a handful of people. I talked about the time that I was raped when I was in college. 
Thankfully, it did not result in a pregnancy, but if it had, I knew that I would have been able to get the care that I needed that was right for me. I knew that in Michigan, I could do what I needed to do if it came to that. The decision about my future would be mine alone. The bill we were debating at the time would have forced me to buy insurance for my own rape before it happened or to bear the child of my attacker. Ten years ago today, I gave that speech, and it didn't change a single vote on the Senate floor. Hundreds of people called and faxed and emailed my office to share their support or to share their own story. I knew then that this fight was not over. Today, exactly 10 years later, I'm honored to stand here as the governor and sign the repeal of that awful law. And I share this story because it reminds us all that when we work to protect our fundamental rights, our reproductive rights, civil rights, LGBTQ plus rights, sometimes that work takes longer than days or weeks. Sometimes maybe it takes a decade and it's still not truly finished. But staying in that fight is the only way to win that fight. Joining us now is the Michigan governor, Gretchen Whitmer. She is the co-chair of the Biden-Harris 2024 re-election campaign. Governor, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Sally. Good to be with you. A number of states, including Florida, are, are trying to get uh, ballot measures like you had in Michigan uh, through to guarantee abortion rights in, in their state. What happens if Donald Trump's threat or promise, depending on how you see it, to impose a 15-week abortion ban comes to pass. Does that, does that have more strength than your state's uh, guarantee? Well, listen, I think one of the things with a guy like Donald Trump is you got to watch what he does. Don't listen to what he says. He says a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, he's the one that put three Supreme Court justices on the bench who took, you know, who overruled Roe v. Wade. And it is exactly why we have a patchwork of rights across this country, why reproductive freedom is under attack. So as we look to what may happen in Florida and what may happen in Arizona, let's be very clear. Abortion is on the ballot in mm -hmm. all 50 states in this election. If Donald Trump becomes our, our president again, he is going to eviscerate many fundamental freedoms, including the right to abortion. And it would impact women in Michigan, New York, California, and every other state state like Ohio that has achieved, you know, protections for this right. And in the last election in your state, uh, you and your, your fellow statewide Democrats leaned into that as an issue and other issues, obviously. Um, it, it is the prototype, perhaps, for what can happen across this country in November. Absolutely. You know, Ellie, I was um, I had to tell my story about being sexually assaulted when I was at Michigan State in undergrad uh, 10 years ago when I was fighting an effort to make it even harder for women to access abortion. It didn't change a single vote that day. But I knew after the response that I heard from people across Michigan that we were right on this issue. Ten years later to the day, I mm -hmm. uh, was able to sign the repeal of that very law. This is a fight we are, we women in America and our families and our allies are ready to have. We shouldn't have to. It is horrifying that we are in this moment, but I don't think anyone should underestimate American women and how strongly we and men and allies across this country feel about this issue, and we are going to win on it. One of the things you did in that speech um, a decade ago when you were the minority leader in the Senate, you said you didn't really, you don't like talking about this that much, but you, you wanted people to see who the women were on the other side of the story, on the other side of the equation. And we have learned that since the fall of Roe, right? These abstractions about women who get abortions uh, have now become real stories about women who are actually dying in the effort to, to have reproductive health care. Well, that's right. And when I told that story, it didn't sway a single vote that day. And sadly, you know, as I just signed into law, you know, this repeal of the ban on paid surrogacy in Michigan, we want to help women and their families, you know, same-sex couples as well, start a family in whatever way makes sense for them, on their own terms, when and when they're ready. We can protect all of those rights. But this, um, this bill that I just signed into law yesterday only had two Republicans 
Republicans vote in favor of it. This is the same mm -hmm. group of people that said, oh, we all support IVF when the mm -hmm. Alabama ruling came out. But then when they had a vote in front of them to protect IVF and to protect surrogacy, they voted no. And so that's why I keep saying, watch what people do. Don't listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. Watch what they do. And that's who will tell you who they are. The, the IVF issue in Alabama, uh, and I'm glad you have straightened this out in Michigan, but it confused many of us because we didn't really understand what, what, what's this about? Why are people against IVF? Most people just think IVF is, is difficult and expensive um, and hard to achieve, but it helps people uh, who are trying to have children. What, what does your law in Michigan now protect against? Well, so we have secured and, and made very clear what the rights are and codified IVF, as well as uh, decriminalized paid surrogacy. I think those were two very important ways that many people create families. And we want to ensure that if you want to have a family, you're ready to have it, you've got all the avenues to do exactly that. You, when, if an embryo is considered a, a human being, has rights of a human being, that means, you know, IVF, of course, you saw what happened in Alabama, but also also could extend to embryonic stem cell research. It could ban the cutting edge research for cures when it comes to Alzheimer's or juvenile diabetes. I mean, this is a really scary moment. And if people are really paying attention, you see how broad all of these attacks could be applied. And it is why this fight is so important and why we've all got to be a part of it. Donald Trump uh, said a lot of things in Michigan that are of interest, including how the country is going to cease to exist if he's not president and um, our, our death to our cities and our suburbs and all this. He also pointed out that suburban housewives uh, love him. He made that made it very specific. He was talking about suburban housewives. This is always a discussion that comes up. If you are from Michigan. Your victories were across the board in urban areas and suburban areas. And on these issues of reproductive rights and freedoms in general, um, it seems to cross a lot of those uh, those those lines. I, I suspect there are some suburban housewives in Michigan who are kind of annoyed that Donald Trump is invoking them uh, for nonsense that they wouldn't support. Well, I sure as heck would be. I mean, we know that the hardworking women and men of this state spoke loud and clear in the last election and sent me back to keep doing this job. And I'll tell you, you know, it, I think that the conversation around our border is serious. We need serious leaders who are going to try to solve problems. Donald Trump couldn't get it done when he was president. He called me and asked me to send the Michigan National Guard, and we did. We performed some surveillance on the southern border to help him out. He couldn't get it fixed. And so when Joe Biden was on the precipice of working with Congress mm -hmm. to finally have some real protections, he's the one that torpedoed it. And so to come into this state and to, to tell people that he was the one that could have fixed it when it's exactly the opposite, that's why I say you can't listen to what these guys say. You got to look at the record. You got to get the facts. And that's why I appreciate the work that you do. How do you convince people who may, including your state, either be complacent about the fact that they've got abortion protections in their state and they've got you as their governor or aren't in love with everything Joe Biden um, has been doing? How do you talk to them without minimizing what may be their valid concerns about the fact that the option if they don't vote for Donald, uh, if they don't vote for Joe Biden or they don't vote at all, is Donald Trump. Well, I, th I think it's by listening. You know, we got to earn people's votes. A vote is an important thing that someone has that, that only that person can exercise, and you got to earn that. I think it starts with listening. I think it, it extends to making sure people have the facts, you know, un putting it out there, what really is at stake in this election. You know, again, an organization, fight like org. if anyone wants to help, but this work that we're doing is, is centered around making sure that people understand just because we've made these great strides in Michigan, so proud of that, it can be undone quickly if we get a Trump term where he gets a legislature or a Congress that'll send him an abortion ban. Um, he's already said he's going to sign it. And that's why we can't let people assume that just because you're in a state that affords you these freedoms right now, that they're always going to be intact. There, we're all at risk in this upcoming presidential election. What about the the movement that we saw, the uncommitted movement during the, the primaries? Those are people who, when presented with the idea that the binary choice between Donald Trump and, and uh, Joe Biden should be clear, have responded by saying, but that minimizes my actual concerns. That means that your things that you're worried about are not that important right now. What does listening to them or hearing them look like to you, specifically in Michigan? Because there are a lot of people who voted, came out to cast an uncommitted ballot. 
Yeah, there are a lot of people hurting. What is happening in, in Gaza and Israel, the hostages, as well as the innocent lives that are, are being lost every single day, it's, it's horrific. And here in Michigan, we've got a huge population that is often one degree of separation from, from people that are suffering or people that are mourning. It is horribly hard. And that's why I think showing up and listening, making sure that we stay focused on solving problems, keeping people safe here at home, and ensuring that they understand all the different things that we are working on to give people a path to a, a good life here, and to make sure that America is a credible force around the world, a force for good. But no voter is, no no group or community is monolithic. We got a lot of work to do, and that's that's just the very real truth. Governor Whitmer, good to see you again. Thank you for spending time with us this evening. Thank you. All right, coming up, breaking election news. Tonight, Joe Biden is winning the Democratic primary in Wisconsin by a bigger margin than Donald Trump is winning the Republican primary. And earlier today, Donald Trump was there lying about the 2020 presidential election results. Wisconsin Democratic Party Chairman Ben Wickler joins us next. It's election day in Wisconsin. At this hour, with nearly 70 percent of the vote in, Joe Biden is winning 87 percent of the Democratic vote, with a little less than 10 percent of the vote going to uninstructed, which is a protest vote in opposition to the war in Gaza. Donald Trump has 76 percent of the Republican vote, with more than 13 percent going to Nikki Haley, who dropped out a month ago, and 4 percent of the Republican vote going to uninstructed. Unclear about what that is. NBC News is projecting that Joe Biden and Donald Trump have won their respective parties' presidential primaries, which all seems pretty obvious since they are both their party's presumed nominees at this point. But sometimes you have to say stuff on the record, especially with Trump. And here's just another example of why. Earlier tonight, Donald Trump held a rally in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where he once again spread lies about the 2020 election and claimed that he won the state of Wisconsin. You know, we won this state. We won this state by a lot. And it came out that we won this state, actually. He didn't win. It didn't come out that he won. That's just a lie. Donald Trump lost the state of Wisconsin in 2020 to President Biden by more than 20,000 votes. Here's what the Wisconsin Secretary of State Sarah Godlewski had to say earlier about the former president's return to her state. You know, today is the first time Trump has been here in almost two years. You know why? He's been too busy focusing on himself, whether that's peddling his next gimmick like buying a Bible or $399 sneakers that just working families can't afford to, you know, being in court because he has 88 criminal charges against him. And as president, Donald Trump, didn't do things for working families here in Wisconsin. Let's talk about his tax plan. You know, his tax plan provided tax breaks for the wealthy 1% in corporations. So the Amazons of the world paid basically zero in taxes. And my parents, who are retired public school teachers, paid more. That's not right. To we look at his tax cuts alone, they increased the deficit by almost $2 trillion. That's not fiscally responsible. Joining us now, Ben Wickler, the chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. Ben, good to see you again. Thank you for uh, being with us. What do you make of the, the results? And I, obviously not the big headlines that Biden won and Trump won, but what do you make of, of how this is all playing out, the number of people who came out, um, the enthusiasm, and the fact that Wisconsin, though Joe Biden won, is a tight place. Well, it's great to be with you, Allie, tonight. And it's a big night in Wisconsin. I think the, the core story is kind of uh, shown with what happened in each party in the election day today. Trump was telling his supporters to wait in line to see him speak. And Democrats were asking people to knock on doors all over the state, which we did. We've knocked on hundreds of thousands of doors, phone calls, relational contacts over the last month, tens of thousands of voters we've reached just today to support local candidates, to get out the vote for President Biden. And then you see the results. The Republican Party is divided. They're still in the middle of a civil war, a civil war about 
whether we should be a democracy about who won in 2020 and whether we should acknowledge reality about national abortion bans, which uh, Trump is teasing that he's about to announce his support for. Uh, we don't know what, exactly what he's going to say. On the Democratic side, there's a clear call for change in the in the Middle East, the, the heartbreaking crisis that we're seeing, and a very clear vote of confidence for President Biden. Democrats want to stop Trump. They want another Biden-Harris term. They want to see progress. And that is what most people want. It's not just uh, hardcore Democrats. Most independents, uh, a lot of Republicans, and almost all Democrats want to see us move forward, protect freedom and democracy, move towards peace and justice, and an economy that works for working people and brings down costs instead of... Uh, ransacking the national treasury to hand out huge bags of money to the ultra wealthy, which is the Trump way of doing the economy. So let's uh, let's divide those two things up. The, the On the one side of things, the, the abortion, the freedoms, the liberty, the future of the country, democracy, that whole bucket of things in a, in a tight place like Wisconsin. In fact, since the last election, we have seen on the matter of abortion, it worked out differently in, in uh, Wisconsin than it did in Michigan because it was a, a judicial election. But we saw people do the same thing that they did in, in Michigan. When pressed about the issues of liberty and freedom, they chose liberty and freedom, and Donald Trump's on the wrong side of that one. That's absolutely right. Everywhere where people have, a ch have had the chance to go to the ballot, uh, ballot box and cast a vote for whether they should make their own decisions about their own bodies or whether politicians should override themselves and their doctors and, and the choices that, that they need to be able to make. Every time, voters vote for freedom. And it's as clear as day. It's as clear as day. And the 2024 election, in some ways, will be a referendum on whether to have a national abortion ban. What the Republicans are putting on the table with Mike Johnson as the Speaker of the House, with these array of MAGA Republicans running for U.S. Senate, including in Wisconsin, Eric Hovde, who last time he ran, supported a total abortion ban in, in 2012, and life begins at conception, the attacks on IVF that we've seen in Alabama. This is what the Republican Party is putting on offer. And on the other side, as President Biden said in his State of the Union address, you, you, you elect a Congress that believed in reproductive freedom, that sends him a bill to put the protections of Roe versus Wade back into place, he will sign that bill. And we will defend reproductive freedom coast to coast, nationwide in Wisconsin and everywhere else. That is the choice that voters have. So However me, they feel about the candidates, they can they can make a choice about whether they want the power to make their own decisions about their own lives or yeah. they want uh, Republican politicians to override it. And it's so as simple as let that. Let me ask you this, because um, you're not running for office. So I think you're going to give me a more straight answer than people who are in office running for office. Nine point three percent of people voted uninstructed. That's thirty one thousand eight hundred or thirty two thousand votes already. And we still have more votes to come in. That's more people who went out and said, I'm not going to support Joe Biden, now we don't know if that happens in the election, then Democrats won by in the last election. That's a, that's a big number. And Michigan was a big number, too. That's enough to sink Democrats in both states if there isn't a better answer than what Biden's come up with so far. Do you worry about that? Well, the voters who cast ballots in the uninstructed column, they voted in the Democratic primary. So they're, they're Democrats. They know that Trump is not the answer. And they were voting to send a message about change that they want to see, not after the election, but before the election. And what they're calling for is what most Americans want and, and the president is, is calling for and working towards, which is an enduring, just peace. That is, that is what people want to see. And when we see the heartbreaking uh, deaths that are happening right now of kids, of, of aid workers, um, and, and the situation with hostages, both for Israel and Palestine, what we need is self-determination and, and peace and a resolution to the crisis that we see right now. Uh, voters are calling for that change, and they're doing it in the most civic way possible, by mm -hmm. casting ballots. If you vote in the primary election, you're much more likely to vote in November. So the opportunity now is to, is to create that change, make clear what the values are that the administration, Biden and Harris, are, are working to advance. And as we see change on the ground, we have the opportunity to come together around that. 
the contrast will become even clearer with a Trump administration. What they would do in this situation is total disregard for the lives of Palestinian civilians, uh, frankly, for the hostages, for just about anyone else. And that's the contrast that will become more and more clear as we make progress. So this is this is a call for change. It's a protest vote in the great American tradition uh -huh. of, of speaking your mind at the ballot box. And it's civic engagement. It's not tuning out from the system. It's getting yep. involved. I think we have a chance to earn all these votes for the Biden-Harris team as we get into November. Well, I, I agree with you. I applaud people who will get up and go to the ballot vo box to, to make their uh, protest. Ben, great to see you, as always. Thank you, my friend. Ben Wickler is the chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. Coming up, the Israeli government is facing widespread condemnation after an airstrike by its military killed seven aid workers trying to feed the people of Gaza. President Biden said today he is outraged and heartbroken, while one senior U.N. official said today... There is no safe place left in Gaza. We'll go to the region for a live report next. Breaking news now. President Joe Biden has issued a statement on the deaths of humanitarian workers in Gaza at the hands of the Israeli Defense Forces. Quote, I am outraged and heartbroken by the deaths of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen, including one American in Gaza yesterday. They were providing food to hungry civilians in the middle of a war. They were brave and selfless. Their deaths are a tragedy. Israel has pledged to conduct a thorough investigation into why the aid workers' vehicles were hit by airstrikes. That investigation must be swift. It must bring accountability, and its findings must be made public. The United States will continue to do all we can to deliver humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians in Gaza through all available means. I will continue to press Israel to do more to facilitate that aid, and we are pushing hard for an immediate ceasefire as part of a hostage deal. I have a team in Cairo working on this right now, end quote. 43-year-old Zomi Francom, an Australian humanitarian aid worker, was one of the seven workers killed in Gaza last night. This is the, the beautiful, fragrant, aromatic rice that will be served today from Dinabala Kitchen. Thank you. World Central Kitchen says Zomi and the six other workers had just unloaded 100 tons of humanitarian food aid when their convoy was attacked by the IDF. Chef Jose Andres, the founder of World Central Kitchen, released this statement, quote, World Central Kitchen lost several of our sisters and brothers in an IDF airstrike in Gaza. I'm heartbroken and grieving for their families and friends and our whole WCK family. These are people. Angels I served alongside in Ukraine, Gaza, Turkey, Morocco, Bahamas, Indonesia. They are not faceless. They are not nameless. The Israeli government needs to stop this indiscriminate killing. It needs to stop restricting humanitarian aid, stop killing civilians and aid workers, and stop using food as a weapon. No more innocent lives lost. Peace starts with our shared humanity. It needs to start now, end quote. Today, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to the attack, saying the IDF, quote, unintentionally hit innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war, and we will do everything so that this thing does not happen again, end quote. Today at a White House press briefing, Andrew Feinberg, White House correspondent for The Independent, pressed the National Security Communications Advisor, John Kirby, for an explanation on what Netanyahu calls the unintentional strike. You described the, uh, the strike as a uh, possible mistake by Israel. According to uh, Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, it wasn't one strike, but three. The first one, then an interval during which aid workers got out of their vehicles, removed the wounded, tried to move to another vehicle, which was struck. And then a third strike, what, as they tried to move and escape in a third vehicle, at which point all of them uh, were dead. How would the second and third strikes of these marked vehicles be a mistake? And why would the U.S. not more forcefully set conditions on the use of U.S.-made weaponry when it is being used to target aid workers? If the first one was a mistake, the second two were targeted with the intent of killing everyone in that convoy. So how do you respond to that? Uh, first of all, there's an investigation going on. So why don't we let it get done? And why don't we see what they find in terms of the decision-making process that led to this terrible outcome? Prime Minister and the IDF have noted that it was their error. If you don't like the word mistake, their error. 
uh, they're investigating it. Let them do that work and let them see what they come up with. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Joining us now from Jerusalem is the journalist Noga Tarnopolsky. She has spent over two decades covering the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Noga, good to see you, my friend. Um, there, there's, this comes in the context of a, a, a lot of things that are happening in Israel right now, including increased protests, uh, a situation you've been covering this for almost two years now, uh, including protests that involved hostage families, uh, and then, of course, this, this deep tragedy. Give me a sense of what, what's happening and what you're hearing where you are. Well, there's a feeling of kind of unreality here right now. This tragedy today involves an organization that it, nobody has any doubts about. It's not like one of the UN agencies that Israel accuses of having been in cahoots, let's say, with Hamas in Gaza. Nobody has any doubts whatsoever about what Chef Jose Andres's um, World Central Kitchen is doing there. And in fact, this is an organization that came and brought food to Israelis initially after the Hamas attack. So it seems to have changed somehow um, whatever Israeli ambivalence there was about the lack of information coming out of Gaza to Israelis. We saw tonight a massive anti-war rally in Jerusalem. I think there's no other way to describe it. Anti-Netanyahu, anti-war and pro-bringing the hostages home uh, at any cost. Um, the government, the Israeli government, feels very threatened by these protests. And for now, there's no movement. I have to say there's no movement on either side. Mm -hmm. Hamas is not accepting uh, a hostage exchange just like the Israeli government also isn't. Yes, yeah, so that was why it was interesting when Joe Biden made that reference. So I've got people in Cairo working on it now, right now, as if there's a potential breakthrough. It would be a surprise to all of us if that were the case. But you, you bring up something interesting, because the anti-war, the anti-Netanyahu protests have been going on for a very, very long time, far uh, before, more than a year before October 7th. They weren't always the same as anti-war protests. It's not always the same people. The, the, the protests are large. You, you would almost think after all these months, they, they'd start to fizzle. They're not. They're getting stronger. And the hostage families are getting more and more frustrated to say, can we get our what is left of our family members back now, and you can sort this other stuff out yourself later? Right. Well, a remarkable thing has happened, and it's just happened in the last 48 hours or so. There have been massive protests. Um, there was some kind of encounter between a few of these families and Netanyahu that left the families feeling uh, completely betrayed. And so they shifted tactics and they announced publicly that they were doing so. And one of the fathers of a hostage came right out and said to Netanyahu, you forced us into the arms of the protest. You've made us one. So you're absolutely right. The families of hostages have spent the last six months now just basically begging to get their loved ones home. And they now feel, and they've said openly, that they feel the Israeli prime minister is an obstacle to that aim. And so they have joined explicitly the anti-Netanyahu protest movement, and they've given a kind of new fuel to this movement. There were 100,000 people surrounding the Knesset. Remember, this is mid-war mm -hmm. with a very you know, a very depressed population here. 100,000 people around the Knesset Sunday night. There's a tent city around the Knesset right now. This is a week-long protest. The government doesn't seem to be reacting, but there is a feeling of a public shift. Interesting. No, guy, because I cover terrible things like hurricanes and disasters, and, uh, you know, I've run into Jose or his people from World Central Kitchen all around the world, um, but often they are there as an adjunct. They're there as an extra support. Uh, the problem in Gaza is that a number of aid agencies have now ceased their work while they evaluate the security situation, but it's not like there's an alternative. The Israelis don't operate from a food distribution perspective in Gaza. Hamas doesn't now operate as a food distribution mechanism in Gaza. We, this is becoming a, this, this famine is becoming very real. Absolutely. And um, I, I don't know what to call what happened, but the catastrophe of uh, last night, and to be frank, 24 hours later, or more than now, 25 hours later, the lack of a coherent Israeli response is leaving Israel stranded as the only party responsible for what is happening in Gaza. Their attempt, the Israeli attempt, 
to bring in international organizations to allow, for example, the UAE to do airdrops and then the US and Jordan. Apparently, what we were here, what I have heard today is that Israel um, wanted um, the World Central Kitchen to have some kind of permanent role distributing aid mm -hmm. inside Gaza. We're kind of counting on them for the future. Obviously, all of that has been blown up mm -hmm. by this disaster. And I think Israel's going to be left having to make very, very difficult decisions in a matter of days. Yeah, it's a, it's a logistical yeah. issue. And if you needed someone to take that over, you would talk to Jose Andres because they they're particularly good at that, but it's it's a weird situation. Noga, thanks as always uh, for adding your analysis and your, your great reporting to this. Noga Tarnopolsky joining us from Jerusalem. All right, coming up, will Judge Aileen Cannon help Donald Trump avoid a criminal trial for possession of classified and other government documents before the election? Andrew Weissman and Brad Moss join us to discuss that next. Special counsel Jack Smith and Donald Trump have until midnight tonight to respond to an order from Judge Aileen Cannon with their proposed jury instructions in the criminal case against Donald Trump for his alleged illegal retention of classified documents and his obstruction of efforts by the government to get them back. Judge Cannon has already said she's considering giving an instruction to jurors that is essentially Donald Trump's defense in the case. Quote, a president has sole authority under the Presidential Records Act to categorize records as personal or presidential during his or her presidency, end quote. Judge Cannon has yet to rule on new proposed dates for the trial to begin, fueling concerns that Jack Smith's proposed July start might not happen. In a paperless order today, Judge Cannon ordered Donald Trump and his co-defendants in the documents case to file a speedy trial report by Friday, saying, quote, the report shall include defendants' positions on all excludable time from the speedy trial period and expressly indicate any defendant's current assertion or waiver of speedy trial rights with associated time frames, end quote. The Palm Beach County uh, State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg tells NBC News that Judge Cannon makes even clearer in her paperless order that the classified documents case was never going to trial before the election, end quote. Joining us now, Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He's an MSNBC legal analyst and the co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Trump Indictments, the Historic Charging Documents, with commentary. And Bradley Moss is a national security attorney who represents people who work in the intelligence community. Good evening to both of you. We have a lot of ground to cover. Bradley, I wanted to start with you because you deal very specifically in matters of, of documents and top secret stuff and classified uh, matters. This thing about letting the jury consider the idea that the president has the right to determine what is a presidential record or not. I don't know much about this, but I, I, I didn't think that was actually really a thing. I didn't think you could, you could sort of give the jury an option to make that determination. No, it's not a thing. You're not alone on that front. That is a strict question of law. If Judge Cannon believes there's some legitimacy to that argument, and that's something Donald Trump has been outlining in his pretrial motions, then she should grant one of his pretrial motions to throw out the indictment and let this go up to the 11th Circuit on appeal. That's a strict question of law. The issue, in fact, would be whether or not the information was national defense information, if Donald Trump was in possession of it um, without authorization, and if he tried to conceal it when confronted by the government. Those are the questions that would be relevant when it comes to an Espionage Act, sorry, Espionage Act charge. I don't know where she was possibly going with this proposed jury instruction, other than the idea that she just doesn't want to have to take, you know, the responsibility of making these decisions and having her name on that opinion that rules against Donald Trump on that. Beyond that, I'm baffled. Right. All right. Uh, Andrew Weiss would take a shot at it. What do you make of, of what that was all about? Uh, I'm uh, I think that the judge is completely in the bag for Donald Trump. I think the uh, the proposal that she gave for two people you know, to you know both sides to sort of address an issue, both options that she set forth are wrong, are legally wrong. Uh, and so the filing today is going to be fascinating because the real issue is, is the government going to view this as the Rubicon, where they are going to be putting a line in the sand saying, you know what, if this is where you're going, if you were saying that you're going to give one of these two wrong instructions, both being wrong, we are going to appeal you. 
Um, we're either going to do it by an appeal, we're going to do it by what's called a writ of mandamus, but we've had it. We're sort of done. And so I'm fascinated to see whether they think this is it. They're, they're, they're kind of done with her because what, to Bradley's point, the reason he is saying he's baffled is because there is no law to support what she's doing, um, that we are in the same situation pre-trial where the 11th Circuit reversed this judge not once but twice. And so the fascinating thing in the next hour is we're going to learn mm -hmm. sort of what the DOJ's view is in terms of how significant they think this is. So, Bradley, let's take that thesis a little further. Maybe she's in the bag for Trump. Andrew makes the point. She has been she has been corrected by by the 11th Circuit a couple times. So you're right. She could just she could send it up and see what happens. Uh, but but how 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 what are the implications of her, her being in the bag for Trump? Because right now, the most serious one seems to be she might make mistakes in how she instructs the, the, the jury, how she deals with things. But that might be appealed. The issue here is, will this trial see the light of day before the election? It's getting really hard to imagine how this is going to happen before the election at this point. If for no other reason than she's just taking her sweet time, more than anyone I can imagine, in a criminal trial to issue rulings, there's been, you know, a pile of motions that have just been stacking up that she still hasn't issued rulings on that have been briefed out for weeks. She had a hearing over a month ago just about the idea of, you know, setting a new trial schedule. She still hasn't done it. I don't know where she's going with this. We do know she, she issued that order asking for a speedy trial report from the defendants, which they haven't done all this time. It's been the government doing it. I don't know if she's trying to iron out details before she finally does set a new trial date. But at this point, I would not be shocked if she says, I'm pushing this off until, you know, sometime in spring 2025. Andrew, you are a TV expert, so you can do this in 60 seconds because that's all the time I have. <laughs> but you argue that she's justifying her sluggishness. Yeah, I think um, I think I'm with Bradley. I think that she is going to point out that she has not violated the Speedy Trial Act. I think she's anticipating that the government may try to go up to the 11th Circuit uh, and that they're going to try and force either a change of judge or to get a trial date set. And she is going to try to create a record that she hasn't been delaying this case and she's been complying with the Speedy Trial Act. That's the only way I can sort of understand her latest paperless order asking for this uh, information from the defense, which seems totally unnecessary. So, I mean, you have an erratic, inexperienced judge who seems quite partisan and re making rulings that seem almost unilaterally in favor of one side. So I would say keep your eye on this filing in terms of whether DOJ has had it. Guys, thanks very much. Andrew Weissman and Bradley Moss. We'll be right back. And that is tonight's last word. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.